Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last panel of the Internet Law and Policy Foundry's content moderation series. Uh, today's panel will focus on the role of governments on online speech moderation. The uh, series has been hosted by the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. Uh, the Foundry is a collaborative organization for Internet Law and Policy professionals who are passionate about disruptive innovation. The Foundry offers members a platform for professional development, constructive debate, and network building within a cohort of skilled attorneys and policy analysts eager to help shape the development of internet law and policy. Today's event is sponsored by TikTok, Microsoft, and Swilgen. Uh, for those of you who have joined us in the past um, or joining the first time, um, the goal of this series is to evaluate online content moderation from different perspectives. Previous panels have included uh, insight from leaders um, such as said, from private companies such as TikTok, Vimeo, who influence community standards development in each of these companies. They provided an overview of the rule and decision-making process within private companies. We also heard from researchers, activists, and human rights advisors on the ambiguity and challenges of defining and moderating hate speech and the fundamental role of international human rights activists and scholars in the decision-making process. Finally, today, uh, we will we include perspectives from researchers and members of civil society on the role of the governments in the definition, regulation, and potentially even criminalization of the misuse of online space. I will be your host and moderator for today. Uh, I am Nakia Chaltri. I graduated from Stanford University in 2019, where I focused uh, on cybersecurity and privacy policy. Since then, I spent a year in trust and safety at Facebook and soon joining the trust and safety team at TikTok. I'm really passionate about this space. This topic is very near and dear to my heart and thrilled for our discussion today. Today, I'm honored to uh, wrap up our series with a wonderful panel of speakers. With us, we have uh, David K. Bertram Lee Jr. and Madeline Lamo. Firstly, uh, David K. is a clinical professor of law at the University of California, Irvine. Director, International Justice Clinic, and Co-Director of Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. Bertram Lee Jr. is Counsel for Media and Tech, the Leadership Council for Civil and Human Rights. Finally, we have Madeline Lamo, Fellow at Swilgen. Uh, David, Bertram, and uh, Maddie, thank you so much for joining us today for this panel. I'll spend about 30 minutes uh, chatting with each of you um, and then open it up to audience questions at about 45 past. So for our audience, um, feel free to send in your questions in the chat throughout the discussion um, or wait until we open up to questions if you want to ask your questions um, to the, to the uh, speakers yourself. With that, uh, let's kick off our panel. Um, just quickly, my, okay, my connection been a bit spotty today. Um, yeah, so during our last panel, we explored the question around who defines hateful conduct online. The broader question there then that lies is who is in charge of rulemaking in the space of online speech. Often there are situations where online space classify for possibilities of restrictions and regulations, or even lack thereof, uh, that are in contrast or even in conflict of regulations offline. So with respect to online space, my question to the three of you is, what do we want governments to define and regulate? Uh, I'll just open the question, um, just kick off with hearing from Professor Kay, and then um, go over to the, the rest of the panelists. Great, Nafia, thank you so much uh, for, for organizing this panel. Uh, thanks for really creating such a, a great uh, group of my co-panelists, I'm really glad to, to be here with them and with you all. Um, one other thing that I would just mention in sort of leading up to, um, into, to answering your question is that I also chair something known as the uh, Global Network Initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder organization that involves uh, companies, NGOs, academics, investors, in, um, in really dealing with a lot of these questions of government demands on internet companies, on uh, telecommunications companies, so not just social media and so forth, but also uh, ISPs and telcos. So, um, so I, I introduced GNI in part because I think 
the way I want to start at least my answer, which I'll, I'll keep brief so this can be a conversation, is to highlight that government demands around content have been extraordinarily uh, problematic, if I can put it in a light way, around the world. I mean, there are government demands for companies to take down content that is critical of government, that is, you know, in the context of, of India, for example, that is critical of, of the government's approach to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've seen around the world governments criminalizing individual content on, you know, with respect to false information, uh, so-called false information. And oftentimes what this ends up doing is, is either giving government or government taking power uh, to determine what is legitimate speech in what has become for so many of us, uh, you know, a privately held public square. And so I think as we think about these issues, I think we need to be very cautious about the kind of power that we want governments to exercise, which is why I, I would start, and then I'll, I'll really just wrap up my my first remark here by saying that I think it's really important for governments to be, to be regulating in the sense of providing users and the public with adequate information, and I would say full information, so that we can make decisions about our own engagement on these platforms, so that individuals know exactly what the platform's rules are, what they're doing with our data, and so forth. Um, but also give policymakers adequate information to make decisions around what kind of regulation, particularly if content regulation is in the cards, what kind of regulation makes sense. And I think that we're, we're at this stage right now that notwithstanding the fact that we've been talking about content issues for so long, we're still in a place where many of us, and particularly policymakers, truly don't fully understand the nature of the decision-making on the platforms. And in order to open that up, we need to start to have that conversation, which could, could then lead us to think about more creative ways to dealing with content. For example, public-private kind of collaborations or multi-stakeholder oversight around content kind of questions with, without giving government the kind of power that ultimately uh, is hostile to, uh, to free debate. Bertram, I'll pass it to you if you want to add something. So um, I appreciate um, what Professor Kay said, but you know, I come at this from a different perspective um, from the civil rights community, right? And there are different equities that take into that are that we take into account as a civil rights community um, from the perspective of this issue, right? Because you know. You know, free speech protections and First Amendment protections are the things that gave us the civil rights movement, Black Lives Matter, women's suffrage, the LBGTQ movement, um, and the disability justice movement. However, um, as a counterbalance, we are seeing broad swaths of voter suppression via disinformation and misinformation, um, target and the targeting of marginalized communities online, particularly trans, Muslim, Latino, and other activists from marginalized communities, right? And so there is a there's a tepid balance that we take, and especially as we have a government that's still has a kind of like black separatist or black identity extremist connotation that it engages in with the context of law enforcement, right? And we're seeing there is an intercept article that was posted, I think, today, um, about how or yesterday, sorry, highlighting how there's dragnet social media monitoring by government already, um, particularly targeting Black Lives Matter. And so I think the the answer to your question is is that I think one of the places that we do want to see regulation is in voter disinformation and misinformation, right? Um, particularly from third actors, right? Now, if you want to get into really um, interesting constitutional law and really interesting historical analysis, you'll realize that a lot of uh, politicians are the are the people who engage in voter disinformation and misinformation. But um, and so that complicates things from a First Amendment perspective. But I do think that making sure that people have an accurate idea on when an election is happening, how they can vote, and that they can vote safely uh, without uh, repercussions or without recourse is something that we can all agree on, right? Um, but when it comes to targeting of activists, 
and the targeting and particularly hate speech online. And particularly when those things target marginalized communities, it gets a little bit trickier from not only a First Amendment perspective, but also from what we're asking government to do. I don't trust the government to actively enforce uh, hate speech against black people online. They don't actively enforce um, hate crimes against black people um, in the regular day-to-day -day world. And particularly they do not enforce hate crimes against trans people, against Latino people, against Muslims, the list goes on, right? Well, I'm not saying that government should be able to do that, but what I can say is that there should be regulations online to help companies fight the disinformation and misinformation battle that they're waging because ultimately that threatens our democracy and it threatens our ability to proactively speak online using our constitutional free speech rights. And so those are kind of equities that the civil rights community is balancing at the moment. Okay. Thanks so much, Bertram. Uh, Maddie, would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Nafia. And thank you for having me. And also apologies in advance. I have some construction noise and a dog who's barking at the construction noise. So hopefully that won't be too disruptive, but um, yeah, I'll try to get through this. Um, but both Professor Kay and Bertram have made really great points. I, I, I agree with so much of what they've both said. I think when we think about the incentives for government to define what types of speech are or are not unprotected online. It's important not only to think about what speech specifically the government may have an interest in prioritizing or protecting, but also what groups speech is important to them and what groups are they interested in, in protecting from harassment and abuse online. And I think because the incentives to sort of preserve an existing power structure are always just going to be really strong and really baked into any kind of government action um, that we should just ask government to to tread lightly, or you know, not encourage the government to too quickly enter the the foray here. And I think um, transparency is perhaps more appropriate of a of an avenue for the government to tread here. To as as Professor Kay alluded to, to try to just get more information out into the public so that. The population as a whole can actually see how um, terms of service and policies and practices that nominally exist are in fact being enforced. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. I think there are some really good points uh, touched on there around how social media is, you know, on the one hand, used for civic engagement, as well as been used uh, as a tool for social control by. Um, governments, um, whether democratic or even authoritarian regimes alike. Um, and of course, um, in terms of what Bertrand mentioned around civil rights, and uh, we have seen that marginalized communities have been disproportionately targeted and impacted by a lot of the, um, the rules of online speech. And often these are the voices that are both not um, voices that go unheard, whether it is we're talking about the boardroom, because they're just not present there, or um, even just online on the online public space. Um, and with respect to that, and, and you all kind of brought up a few different topics of propaganda, hate, mis disinformation, and elections. So I would love to hear a little bit and go like a little deeper into that around what is it then should the government's role look like? Is it more around defining what hate speech is? For example, that is something that Germany has done, which is around definition of hate speech. Um, there have been different uh, countries that have tried to define and even criminalize misinformation. Um, is it that they should go in and define this for these companies? Um, or is it, should they just focus on transparency um, or just sending in different law enforcement requests? Um, could you, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I'll start off with Bertram this time. So I don't think, I think Maddie brings up a great point. If social media companies were to enforce their own current terms of service um, equitably, um, and particularly not necessarily target marginalized communities, right? And allow white um, supremacist and white nationalist content to continually rise within their ranks of what most of the engaged content, and instead actually like, you know, enforce what their hate speech um, uh, protocols were, right? 
we saw, saw this within the highlighted, within uh, what the Wall Street Journal did um, with respect to uh, Facebook, we would actually have a much better in internet infrastructure, but the monetary value of white nationalists is before kind of democracy is what we're seeing, especially within these broader platforms. And that's true on, especially on Facebook. Um, and so kind of as we're thinking about what the government does, it does not define, I, I do want to point folks to something that happened in late August, uh, about a month ago with the FCC, where the FCC fined uh, some robocallers who were engaging in voter disinformation um, and engaging in voter suppression, $5 million, right? That case is still ongoing within the context of the FCC, but I think we currently have enough rules on the books. It's just whether we want to enforce them, right? Um, and I want to really put... I really want to put a I really want to highlight the Senate Intel report on the 2016 election, um, particularly when it came to social media and social media monitoring, um, and how foreign actors were targeting black folk um, to in, get them not to vote, and that is just something that we already have laws on the books for. If you're aiding abetting and if you're aiding and abetting a foreign power to suppress votes within an election, I would imagine that's illegal, right? And what does enforcement in those contexts look like, right? We already have the things we need in order to enforce uh, these kind of content moderation bans. It's just what, um, what, it would, what it would look like is it would look like social media companies losing money on, again, the engagement that they get with white nationalists and white supremacists on their platforms. And again, there is a disparate impact that they have on whether they are protecting marginalized communities in those same contexts, which they're not because the dollars don't make sense for them to in order to do so. And so that kind of, if you want to attack a social media company, it's not necessarily engaging in new laws per se, but it's engaging in avid and robust enforcement when these things intercede and where government already has laws on the books for um, election meddling and election suppression by especially outside powers, but even by um, national powers, right? There are a um, whole bunch of um, what I would, what's the proper term for them? But there are a whole bunch of places where uh, you're seeing people engage in voter misinformation and disinformation in these little hubs within the US itself, right? What are there, it, those things, there has to be a federal law that they violate, that we are just not engaged in actually um, putting them on the books for, or actually engaging in avid enforcement. And so like, I think within that context, we have enough things on the books to be able to say, hey, what does that look like? But again, within the context of the, of the United States, there has never been robust enforcement of civil rights laws. There's never been robust enforcement of voter suppression laws. There has never been robust enforcement of hate crime laws. There's never been robust enforcement of protecting marginalized communities within this context. And content moderation is no different in those circumstances. Maddie, I'll pass it to you to share some of your thoughts. Those are all really great points that Bertram makes. I think also as, as we think about the role of government even more broadly, something that comes to mind for me is universities, which of course can be public or they can be private, but I'm a, a proud alum of the University of Washington School alum. And shortly after I graduated the law school as well as several other sort of faculties within the university formed something called the Center for an Informed Public. And they obviously have private donors that support their work, but they are at their core a, a, a part of a public institution. And the Center for an Informed Public does really important and meaningful research on misinformation and disinformation. So if, which I think we can all agree that stopping the spread of, of misinfo and disinfo, particularly around things like elections or like health during a pandemic, that's a top priority that governments share and surely social media platforms would like to at least not, you know, worsen the circumstances around. It's important to understand how misinformation and disinformation spread if, if we're going to meaningfully address these problems. And of course, solving those problems is not simple, but there are there are skilled researchers that need funding and they need a home and they need institutional support for the work that they do. And so, although it's not a legislative solution per se, I think um, universities providing support, including you know state sponsored universities providing support for that kind of research, is one way that indirectly there can be better enforcement or, or more meaningful regulation um, 
or in, in the world of content moderation. Thank you, Maddie. I'll pass it to uh, Professor Kay to share your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. These, these are really great responses. And I want to um, maybe uh, reflect on and also amplify a bit what Bertram was, was suggesting. You know, I think, I think it's really important to recognize that there are certain kinds of very well-defined harms to our, to our democracy, to our election system, uh, harms that are uh, sort of um, basic forms of discrimination and electoral uh, subversion and so forth. And those kinds of uh, rules should be applied regardless of whether we're talking about offline or online space. And, and so to the extent that there's the potential, and we've seen this already, for, for example, voter disinformation that might lead someone, and I don't mean in this sort of broad esoteric sense, but in the very specific sense of where you can vote and who can vote, those kinds of, those forms of disinformation can be very harmful. The, the question to my mind, whether we're talking about that kind of kind of problematic content or we're talking about other forms of problematic content is, is sort of the, the question, Nafia, that was embedded in your question, which is who should be deciding? And so one is, so one way of thinking about this is are our public institutions that is our departments of justice uh, at, you know, at, at federal and state levels, are they doing the right thing to ensure a robust space for expression and access to the ballot? Um, are they doing those things? Are they conducting investigations and so forth that are necessary in that context? Oftentimes they're not, right? But then the, the subsequent question is, should this be left up to the companies to make the kinds of decisions around what is problematic content? To a certain extent, they should be doing this. Of course, they should be uh, really on top of the question of voter disinformation, of hate speech, of misogyny, of other kinds of content. But I think that when it comes to some other issues, we've largely left out our courts from, and this is certainly true outside of the United States, where you've seen law develop where essentially governments say, here's the rule, uh, companies, it's up to you to make decisions as to how you enforce these rules, but you must enforce these rules. And what that ends up doing is providing these companies with ever more power over this space rather than giving the public a way, whether through the courts or other policymaking apparatus, to be involved in those decisions. And I think we need to, we need to have clarity as to how that happens, but we, we also need to be clear about the distinction between those real defined, all, I think as Bertram made clear, already defined harms in our public law that need to be implemented and observed by the companies, but that also there needs to be outside enforcement of that by public institutions that we often simply do not see. Mm -hmm. Nafia, am I allowed to follow up with something Professor K said? Because I think there's, yes. a, I agree in, I, 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 I agree in most dissent in part. And, but I wanna kind of put the context of the courts into question, right? Because ultimately when we're talking about first amendment analysis, you know, platforms are exempt, right? They're, they are not government institutions. And so what are we going to be bringing to the court? And my biggest question and a big fear that I have is that if we extend first amendment protections to private institutions, the way that the, the, way that the court has been with, um, I would say um, the, with corporate free speech and corporate speech, right? We could end up, albeit like unintentionally so, laying the foundation to reverse many of our civil rights laws by saying, hey, these corporations can discriminate because they have speech and they're allowed to be, they're allowed to engage in that kind of speech. And, you know, this discrimination is not necessarily, if someone says something discriminatory, that's just them ex exercising their speech. And so like long, long gaming this, I think 
folks in the civil rights community are just kind of like concerned when it comes to the courts, not only by the way the Supreme Court has ruled on any number of issues with related to civil rights, right? But also with respect to how conservative the courts are in so many jurisdictions. And like one of the things that's going to be interesting is how the courts deal with the Texas and Florida social media kind of laws that have just come out, right? And how those impact and how those are going to ultimately, I think, impact marginalized communities within those contexts. And so like, I'm just always very cautious when it comes to bringing in the courts because I'm not saying that courts don't make good decisions. I'm just saying on these particular issues as politicized as they are, and speech is a politicized issue, that I can't trust a court to be neutral in those circumstances because I don't think the law benefits neutrality or they benefit or them looking or the courts in those circumstances looking at the law in a neutral fashion benefits anyone because then we could end up laying the foundation to reverse so many of the gains that so many marginalized communities have made over the past 70 years. I, I think these are really good points. I'm I'm glad uh, that I'm glad that you raised I can look directly at you, Bertram. I mean I, I'm glad that you're you're raising these these issues. And I think that you're exactly right that in part because of the way the Supreme Court has, you know, essentially valorized and prioritized a particular way of thinking about speech, um, that we do face some very serious risks in the future as to this, you know, because at the same time that you've had that, you've also had, you know, Citizens United and other, you know, kind of innovations at the court level that actually end up harming the freedom of our of our elections and of access to the vote. So I totally agree with all of that. I think the question then that flows from that, which is in a way, Nafia, at, at the heart of, of the panel, um, is still who decides. And and we're we're in this space right now, I think, of, of a kind of confusion uh, in society as to who should be making these decisions because even though the courts might not be the best place to make these decisions, the companies themselves are also problematic decision makers because they also have their own set of, you know, business interests, growth interests, and so forth, and, you know, engagement, business model kinds of interests that might not align with reaching uh, decisions that, you know, society needs or that individuals need in order to freely debate issues or have access to the ballot and so forth. So I think that, I mean, I'm not answering the question as much as suggesting that the problem is at the moment is identifying where is the, the kind of the locus for making these kinds of decisions for ensuring access to the ballot. And my only point in looking at the, at the global perspective is that when we have seen governments step into this space, governments have often, you know, maybe identified particular rules that make some sense, but they've given the power to the companies to make those decisions. And that has only increased their power and also in some senses led to a kind of increase in discrimination and the possibilities of discrimination. So we're at a point now where we, we really have to think creatively about what, you know, how these decisions should be taken. Maddie, would you like to chime in in that conversation? Oh, um, it's so interesting. I, I don't know if I have anything to add on this specific point, but. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of great points raised there. I think some some that, um, like one that I just really want to follow up on, uh, you both mentioned that there are you know a lot of bust um, for um, already defined legislation and public institutions that already exist. I'm curious if, um, and broadly, both uh, like all three of you and even in the previous panel, uh, everyone was very critical of the, the regulatory responses that have been taken so far, whether in the US, uh, there has been criticism of, um, in the previous panel, Eric Goldman uh, made some uh, criticism of the Texas and Florida law. And I'm also curious, just in general, then, has there been any uh, an, an example of a template of a regulatory response that has worked? Um, are there any learnings that we can take from that uh, moving forward, whether it is with respect to 
the issue of misinformation, election interference, or hateful conduct, um, or or the entire um, or anything related to online content moderation. I'd say Sesta Fosta. No, I'm joking. Um, but I think uh, I think what we're at, and really what the content moderation conversation is, particularly for marginalized communities, and like I, I can't stress this enough, right? Women and people of color are under attack across the United States, particularly in red states. We have to come to grips with that, right? Because unless we really have that as like a fundamental understanding, and I know uh, Professor K, you want to take this globally, but like, you know, I think as folks, as where the companies sit is just as important and the, and the social and the socioeconomic context in which these companies sit and the country in which they sit is incredibly important to understand just kind of how these companies are going to move forward because our democracy is under attack. And if we have a, another attempt at an authoritarian regime in the United States with people who are slightly more capable, uh, we could see these social media companies expounding what is ostensibly um, a lot of what we're seeing in uh, Texas, Florida, Louisiana, uh, not necessarily Louisiana, but Texas, Florida, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and a lot of these states. We could see that pushed out more broadly globally. And what we're seeing in the United States is we've never been more polarized. We've never been able to not have conversations across aisles. And a part of that is the ways in which content is moderated, right? And these are decisions by companies to get dollars. And so like when we're talking about effective government responses, we don't have one because we don't know the scope of the problem. We don't actually know how bad this is. And because everybody's not on Twitter, everybody's not on Facebook, people have conversations amongst themselves. And when you take away kind of the monikers, people are able to have much more robust conversations. But how charged things are right now within the context of our democracy is so important for the context of how we're talking about content moderation issues, because things are going to come to a head at some point, right? They came to a head earlier this year in January 6th. Right. As if to say that we're not in and a part of how January 6th became January 6th was that Facebook didn't engage in robust content moderation to enforce its own rules to be able to stop hate speech from spreading and possibly creating the end to the American democracy. Like that's the full statement, full stop. We don't have yet a great response to that because we have not yet dealt with some of the factors that are creating these situations and what role social media companies are playing in this. We don't understand. And so like a robust regulatory enforcement is not from whether it's the FTC or whatever regulatory body, you know, uh, Congress decides, right? Whatever regulatory body we, we need to have engage, we need to engage in robust fact-finding missions about what is happening, what is going on, and we need to fund these institutions in order to do so. Because without that, we're only going to see more and more events like this happen online because without that, the reality is, is that most Americans don't really understand the threat of white nationalism. And really when I talk about content moderation and when I really think about content moderation, it's a war against white nationalism. It's a war against um, the folks who oppose context of civil rights, the folks who oppose uh, women's rights, um, black folks' rights, Latino folks' rights, Muslim people's rights, like uh, LGBTQ rights, trans folks' rights, especially, right? That's the kind of war we're fighting within the context of content moderation. But we, again, we don't know the full context. And so government, I don't know whether it can play a content moderator role, but I think it can play a fact-finding role. And that's what we need these institutions to do. And, you know, again, big shout out to the Wall Street Journal on this for putting that forward in the intercept. They've been doing great work on these things, but we need more institutions. And it's, again, not just government, but it's also, um, it is also journalists as well. And journalism institutions need to do a much better job of contextualizing this and finding things out so that we can understand what is going on. Well, oh, good. Maybe, maybe I could just um, respond to that because I think that that leads to, I think to a, a question about well, what what does that look like? I mean, so far, whenever, um, whenever government, whenever the U.S. government, and let's say whenever Congress has brought the companies to you know to Congress for hearings and to do that kind of you know, fact finding, you know, it's been a kind of clown show. I think we'd all kind of agree, right? It, it looks on the on the congressional side, 
you have a lot of posturing, um, a lot of, um, you know, basically um, a failure to get at the root problems that Bertram was describing. And so what I think we do need to think through is what does institutionalizing that kind of fact finding involve so that it's not just sort of these public hearings in which, you know, the, the lead you know, CEOs of the company sit before congressional committees, but how do we dig in? And I would use the model of human rights fact-finding um, for this kind of purpose. How do we institutionalize that? And also how do we open up the companies to that kind of analysis? Because as much as, you know, Wall Street Journal articles or New York Times articles or Intercept or other reporting, they, they're scratching the surface in terms of what we need to know. And so, I mean, I do think, and you know, we've seen this in the last several months where there've been real problems of researcher access to you know, getting under the hood of what's happening in social media companies, particularly with respect to Facebook. But I think there's a lot of room here. And by the way, in the European Union, there's a um, basically a pe pending piece of legislation. It's gonna take a long time for this to come uh, to fruition, but it's called the Digital Services Act. And the DSA actually talks about giving the European Commission power to make requests, essentially the kinds of things that Bertram's talking about, like fact-finding requests, you know, basic um, research into what's happening in the companies on particular content issues, particularly related to things like hate speech and misinformation, and that kind of approach where actually government has the power to do this. Um, to make demands uh, of, you know, of the companies so that they can understand what's happening and also to give researchers access to what's happening in the companies. I think that's going to be essential. And it's essential not only so that we can see what's happening, you know, what the companies are actually doing, but also to give us tools to know what are the responses to this and what we expect the companies to be doing in response to racism, xenophobia, misogyny, anti-trans, anti-LGBTQI kinds of content that, you know, is kind of coursing through the veins of all of the platforms. Um, to, yeah, to speak more about the stymieing of research, uh, particularly by Facebook, um, and to sort of take it back to Nafia's original question, if there's any regulatory responses that have been effective Broadly, I, I, I can't point to any regulatory responses that I would hold up as a model, but sort of one positive step or like a, a microcosm of, you know, what a, a more positive regulatory regime might look like. Um, so the Facebook has really engaged in efforts to stymie research done by, by private researchers, specifically two researchers from NYU who are now being represented by the Knight Institute in Ballard Spar, they were attempting to research, they still are, I suppose, attempting to research sort of who sees what ads and why. So it's, you know, it's more broad than just things like political and voter suppression advertising, but it would touch on that. And that's important to understand. And Facebook is, uh, sent them a, a cease and desist letter after many months of negotiations and efforts to get Facebook to basically just sign off on this research to allow them to do it. Um, Facebook did not agree to allow them to conduct this research and it shut down the two researchers' personal Facebook accounts, which although it was not the core component of their broader research on um, ad placements, it, was, it, it sort of facilitated and enabled some of the more sophisticated components of their research. Um, and part of the justification that Facebook offered for refusing to allow this research was the consent decree that they're under from, from the FTC based on previous violations of user privacy. And the FTC actually um, intervened and sent a letter saying that this consent decree should not be interpreted as prohibiting this kind of research. This research is important and positive and we hope you're not using user privacy as a sort of um, smoke screen to, to prohibit this kind of, you know, valid and meaningful and privacy protective research, because I, I 
omitted to mention, uh, neglected to mention this earlier, but the, the way that these NYU researchers are doing their research is very privacy protective. They're, they're not really collecting PII and everything is done with users full meaningful consent. And people are basically just volunteering to share what ads they see and why they're seeing them according to the little Facebook algorithm. So um, just, you know, a small little kudo to the FTC for that. Um, and just an example of ways in which existing, you know, agreements or laws can be enforced or not enforced or interpreted in a way that benefits the greater good and allows for more understanding rather than less. Because I think, you know, we, we all agree that deeper understandings of the problems that we're facing and the ways in which disinformation is deployed is, is essential to even begin to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, again, some really great points. And I think uh, to touch on Maddie's point a little bit and just um, ask like a follow-up question to that um, is that there's the, the algorithms are so opaque and there's been a lot of requests on more transparency around the algorithms and even more agency to a request for more agency for users to decide as to what it is that they're viewing. Because uh, as we've repeatedly seen um, in any misinformation, disinformation campaigns or, or hateful conduct, it's again, marginalized communities are much more severely impacted as we've seen the black community being uh, much more uh, disproportionately impacted by uh, during COVID, a lot of COVID misinformation than any other communities. And um, I think there, there still lacks some transparency around the algorithms. So I'm curious there whether, um, as you're waiting for audience questions, I'm curious to hear, you know, do you think there should be some regulatory pressure to change some of the incentives and values that these companies hold with respect to virality? Because most of this is driven by vir uh, virality. So I'm curious whether there should be some changes made inherently to what they're prioritizing in these algorithms. Um, I think that's a really interesting question, and it's a, a tough one. Um, I do broadly, it intuitively feels like virality should should not be the metric of, you know, sort of the driving metric, particularly when it comes to sort of these core issues like health and democracy. Um, but whether it's appropriate, what, what, how that could be legislated, um, I'm not entirely sure. It feels like it would have to be sort of a, a multi-step process. So I think it's a, a noble goal, but I, I don't quite know if I see a, a clear way for it to be imposed by, by government. Uh, maybe I, I think that I agree with Maddie. It, this is a, it's a really good question. And you know, the question of business model, the question of thinking about the platforms and thinking about regulation in the context of consumers, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, the platforms and all the platforms, right? They are vehicles for advertising. I mean, we, we also happen to use them for public debate, for exchange of information, and they can be intensely valuable for, for that kind of uh, connectivity and sharing, um, but at the end of the day, they're making money because because of the the you know the core business model that they have, and and certainly the virality of uh, of particular posts is is a part of that. And so, you know, one way of thinking about regulation is to think exactly about this question of of business model. Uh, there was a report by Ranking Digital Rights. Uh, earlier this year, or maybe last year, I don't know, COVID time doesn't really matter much to <laughs> anymore. But uh, I would encourage people to look at RDR's report on business model, which is, I think, really a uh, valuable way of thinking about these things. But, but I also do think that there are, um, that there are approaches to, to these issues that really start with transparency and openness. And, and finally, the possibility of really requiring companies to undertake the kind of what we might think of as human rights impact assessment. You know, we require big companies 
to do environmental impact assessments in order to get regulatory approval to introduce products and so forth. Well, here we're talking about platforms that have massive impact on democratic space well, and, on, and on individual well-being as they introduce products or maybe enter, enter into markets. One way of thinking about opening up their impact is to require a human rights impact assessment so we can actually see what it is that they're proposing to introduce and the mitigations that they might be suggesting or proposing in order to address the impact that they'll have on communities. I think that would be one way of thinking about how to open up uh, the, the conversation and to open up the, the regulatory discussion in particular uh, in a more maybe targeted way. So to add to Professor Kay's point, I think one, there is already a budding industry of kind of algorithmic assessments and algorithmic auditing. Um, Amazon has its own thing. Google has its own thing. There are a number of companies that are engaging in algorithmic auditing across the technological sphere because, again, we don't know enough about the AI technology as it is and, you know, things like data drift, um, bad, um, bad data sets, right? Uh, bad questions that are being asked and whether the AI is being asked to do something that it fundamentally shouldn't be doing in the first place. These are all questions that corporate entities are dealing with now. And so third party auditing is something that one, we've always asked for from kind of like an algorithmic bias perspective, but also would be very helpful from a content moderation perspective. And also, I think to add to Professor Kay's point, it's not just human rights audits, but it's civil rights audits. And uh, Facebook went through its own civil rights audit, and it is slowly, I think, trying to actually um, make those recommendations for its civil rights audits real. But, you know, the leadership conference um, has requested that all of the major platforms engage um, in civil rights audits because, you know, we already have laws, again, on the books about discrimination and about kind of like the impact that these um, platforms have on marginalized communities, particularly when it comes to education, housing, employment, credit, um, voting in even certain circumstances. And so when we're talking about those, the auditing process, we have to kind of like come to bear with the idea that there are already discriminatory ideas that, um, or discriminatory things that platforms are doing and have found to be doing, um, as Maddie highlighted, right? Upturns research on uh, Facebook's, uh, uh, Upturns research on Facebook's um, advertisements, particularly when it comes to jobs, right? has shown clear discrimination. Um, and, and, the, and that research is, was absolutely incredible, right? And they're not the only platform doing that. And so I think real auditing of the AI is going to become, I think, a meaningful requirement, but also there's business incentive to do so. And if we can just take that business incentive and say, hey, you're incentivized to do this anyway, you also need to look at the civil rights impact of this. What is the impact on women? What is the impact on marginalized communities? Where is your data drift? How is that impacting the services that you're giving? That you're giving? And then also, how is that impacting how you're engaging in moderation practices? I think we're going to be able to get to a point within the near future where those things are going to be commonplace. But the thing that is going to make the difference between us having a better democracy and the platforms engage, making more money um, is whether those audits are in some way, shape or form transparent. And so I think that's going to be kind of like the next major step in that direction. Thank you, thanks for answering that question. We have a few audience questions. Uh, the first is from Renata Barreto. Um, they said that they research, their research focuses on the oper operationalization of SESTA-FOSTA by social media companies' machine learning models. Uh, they're curious uh, what the panel thinks about the future of CDA 230 in the wake of SESTA-FOSTA, and what will these changes mean for marginalized people? Maddie, or Bertrand, since you're, okay, you unmuted a few. Okay, Maddie, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, this sounds like important and interesting research, and I would I would love to read your findings. Um, I Section two hundred and thirty has obviously been largely interpreted to give platforms just vast immunity, and it has it has been credited with you know facilitating the development of a you know just <laughs> diverse and vigorous debate on the internet and you know allowing so many things to 
develop for good or for bad online. Um, and Sesta Fosta is, is an example of perhaps a, a well-intentioned, but um, difficult to implement in a non-discriminatory way type of government intervention. I, it, it seems like yet another circumstance where good intentions may be enforced or implemented in a way that disproportionately harms marginalized communities and it will perhaps not have its full intended effect at actually prohibiting you know the sexual exploitation of, of children online I, but i you know I'm, I'm interested to see what you find in your research and sort of what time shows on this topic Yeah, Renata, um, I think um, I agree with Maddie. And I also think that um, when there was a previous bill that I pray to God is dead, um, that was trying to, that was being introduced um, that I cannot remember the name of off the top of my head, that was trying to do basically sesta fosta, um, basically on steroids. And um, what it, ended up doing and what I think a lot of interesting research that I saw found was that SESTA-FOSTA particularly had a really, so before SESTA-FOSTA researchers were actually able to like track sex workers online um, because those communities were at least somewhat open and it actually helped that community and it really helped um, not only give members of those communities um, the ability to kind of like gain more control over their bodies, but also take sex work out of the black market, which has like a ton of benefits, particularly for that community. Um, but when sesta Fosta was enacted, what it ended up being is that you saw that one, um, there was a targeting of sex workers, right? Um, but there was also a targeting of like young kids of color online and young kids of color, particularly within the context of like schools, were particularly targeted by like companies and ultimately by law enforcement because of the reporting requirements. And so I think that within that context, it's really important to think about what amendments to section 230 mean. But on the flip side, um, I think there is a really honest conversation that we have to have about whether 230 immunizes platforms for civil rights violations. That hasn't been fully vetted out by the court. And right now, a lot of um, advocates are relying on um, really what is um, one case, which is roommates. And that's not enough. Because right now, we know that advertising platforms are discriminating against marginalized communities. There's just so much research to show that. And so there does have to be a very broad conversation about what does enforcement look like? And again, what does broad civil rights enforcement within that context look like, particularly when it comes to Section 230? And again, these are just my ideas. These are not necessarily leadership conference ideas. I want to be clear about that. But like, uh, if you're asking what I think of the future of Section 230, I think we're going to have to have a very real conversation about what the roles and responsibilities of these platforms are, particularly to marginalized communities. And civil rights law plays a massive role. Thank you, Renata. Um, David, would you like to add anything to that? I think my co-panelists covered this really nicely. I guess the, the only thing that I would say, in a way, it goes back to our earlier discussion about the, the Supreme Court and its, its approach to the First Amendment, which is to say that um, I think we just need to be a little bit uh, kind of uh, humble in a way about the role of Section 230. Ultimately, even in a world without Section 230, we're, we face a lot of the same problems um, and the same protections. I mean, depending on how you see uh, the First Amendment, but the First Amendment plays such a massive role here in framing things. Um, you know, it may be that even in the absence of Section 230, uh, the, the, you know, the Supreme Court won't be all that amenable to some of the arguments about constraining um, and uh, kind of putting into a, a regulatory framework, at least when it comes to content, some of the restrictions that we might want to see on uh, on companies and their content 
moderation practices. Just something to keep in as kind of background in our Section 230 discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know we have just two minutes left. I'll just try to get to, we have one more, a few more questions. Um, and one I'm really curious to hear about from all of you really in brief as well. Um, someone asked uh, what the speakers think about, you know, consumer choice argument that if you don't like how we operate, you can use another platform, um, assuming there's a genuine plurality of, of, of options, which in reality, that doesn't exist in a lot of countries. I think a, a lot of countries like I'm from Bangladesh and in Bangladesh, Facebook is internet. So um, that, I mean, obviously you can imagine what power Facebook holds in a country like that uh, and in democratic spaces. But um, yeah, I would love to hear uh, very briefly your thoughts on that before we close. Maybe since I'm already unmuted, I'll just say really, really briefly. I mean, I think it's, it's a great question. Um, it, it doesn't address or doesn't allow us to address the question of harm, right? So harms take place whether there's option for particular individuals or not, which is in a way why, you know, the hashtag delete Facebook isn't really an effective public policy response to the issues that we're talking about. We need public policy, just a question of, you know, individual choice as to whether, as, as to, whether to be on a platform or not. I still think that's, a, important and that that's in part why the transparency kinds of initiatives that we've you know kind of talked a, a little bit about are so important because they do give us the ability to make informed choices but ultimately at the end of the day there are the issues nafia that, that you just mentioned that sometimes there is no other choice and there's the question simply that this doesn't answer the question of of harm and impact that the platforms have regardless of individual choice I, I agree with Professor Kay's points. Um, I, I think in order for there to be any semblance of meaningful choice, even, even in a, a theoretical world where you have maybe more platforms to choose from, you need to actually understand the harms. So many of these harms are invisible. It's that you never saw an ad for a job to apply to. So as a, as a user of that platform, how could you know that you're being disadvantaged by using it absent some bigger, you know, transparency efforts and research and all these meaningful ways to actually improve understanding. Also as a, just, this is just more of an atmospheric point, but in thinking of this as a consumer choice, I think it's important to keep in mind that we are not really the consumers of social media. We are the products and advertisers are the true consumers. And I don't know quite what analogies to make with that, but in thinking of, you know, comparing it to, you know, shop elsewhere if you don't like a company's policies on, you know, it uses sweatshops or whatever. It's not quite the same because our role is not quite the same in this ecosystem as with true consumer products. And just to quickly add before we close that, because I know we're over time, um, to answer two questions in one. What we see is that in competition, particularly in civil rights spaces, that does not mean more transparency or more accountability, right? Um, housing, employment, and credit lending marketplaces are some of the most competitive platform marketplaces that we have, but we do not see robust um, enforcement of civil and human rights laws. And so one of the things that we're talking about when it comes to companies and the amplification of marginalized communities is that we need enforcement. We need enforcement of the current context of civil rights laws, but we also need enforcement of like me of the laws that we have on the books, particularly on antitrust, market control, so on and so forth, because those are the things that are actually going to make an impact because when we have it, we have the ability to actually make meaningful choices because then markets are asked to play by the same rules. But right now, they're really not. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for answering that question. We do have a few other questions, but unfortunately, we're over time. Uh, really sorry about that. Um, and thank you. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, David, Bertram, and Maddie for sharing your knowledge and, and insights with us today. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, TikTok, Microsoft, and Swilgen. And finally, thank you to all the attendees uh, for joining. I know some of you have been, have been seeing, uh, have been joining throughout the entire series. Um, sending in your questions and making this such a lively discussion. I hope this was as educational and uh, for all of you as much as, as it has been for me. 
Um, we look forward to having you all at our future panels and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Eddie. Thanks for having us. Thanks.